third speaker. Um, we're very privileged to have um, Matthew Barker, who is an engineering graduate from the University of Cambridge, where he was part of the machine learning group. His research focuses on explainable AI, and he now works as a researcher for Trustwise, developing trustworthy language models. And he'll be speaking about AI and machine learning. Thank you, Matthew. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes. Is that? Yes. OK. Perfect. Yeah, so I'll be talking for the next sort of half an hour or so on machine learning and AI. Uh, specifically, I'll try to focus on clinicians uh, because I guess that's what you all are. Um, a little caveat to that, I'm not a clinician. So although I try to make it relevant using examples, um, some of my medical terms may be slightly off. So forgive me, but hopefully the machine learning part is OK. Right, so I'll give a quick 30 second pitch on why, why I guess you should listen to me. Um, Machine learning seems like a really, really big deal. It's always in the news. This is a screenshot from BBC News about a week ago, and it seems like there's always new articles about AI and machine learning. This next company's released this software. This regulation is coming out. These laws are coming out. This company's done this wrong thing. So it's kind of the talk of the town at the moment. And why is that the case? Well, it's simply because the performance has improved dramatically in the past couple of years. So this is the performance of GPT-4, which is um, a more advanced version of ChatGPT on various test scores. Um, and the one I've picked out is the Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Programme, because I guess you're all medical students. So that's that's a good one to pick. And you'll notice GPT-4, hopefully you can see it, scores 75%. Um, and apparently the typical human scores around 50 to 60%. So it's already achieving superhuman performance on test scores which are being used to evaluate humans. Um, so that's quite alarming. I guess you may be thinking, oh, well, that's just these multiple choice questions. I've done them. They're just memorization. Clearly, a computer could do that. If I had access to the internet, I'd do really well. Um, well, this is when a clinical example where they've the prompt in top is asking um, ChatGPT to uh, diagnose based on certain characteristics and say, oh, how likely is it to be each disease? And you'll notice it produces something which seems coherent. At least it seems coherent to me. The medicine may be wrong, um, but it's it's already doing quite well. Um, OK, so hopefully that sort of uh, piqued your interest. Um, I'll just give a bit of information about me. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a graduate from the University of Cambridge and I was part of the Computational Biological Learning Lab. Um, previously, I worked in healthcare industry, so I was the first developer for Happier Health, developing migraine tracking apps, and then I worked for Siemens, so in their health and ears, trying to improve um, MRI scanners, and now I work at Trustwise. Um, I will say, do feel free to like leave messages or leave um, questions in the chat or the Q&A as we go along. You don't have to save them all to the end. I'll try and get some if I can. But I know what it's like trying to save up a question and then you've forgotten it by the end. So do put it in and I'll try to get to it when I can. OK, so this is how the next sort of 25 or so minutes will go. I'll talk for two minutes on what machine learning is um, and then I'll talk about the different types and then talk how you can use it and more importantly, why you should use it. Um, each of these sections should be more or less self-contained. So if you get really lost, hopefully you can you can come back in. Um, and it should be relatively easy to follow. OK, so firstly, what is machine learning? Uh, we have this fairly dry definition, if I if I Google it, um, from Oxford Languages. Um, there's two things I want to point out here, is machine learning is not following explicit instructions. So I'm not telling a model, make predictions for this certain thing based on these rules. I'm not doing that. I'm asking it to learn the rules itself. How is it doing that? Well, it's looking at patterns in the data and using these to figure out its own way of solving a problem. And this is encapsulated nicely in the comic below. So without machine learning, it's just reading very specific instructions like a recipe from a cookbook. But with machine learning, you basically throw a lot of data at it and the model will try and learn itself, which is very clever because the key thing is we may not know these exact patterns, but a machine which can analyze much, much more data than we can can probably see some patterns that we can't. OK, um, next, if I try and boil this down to a very simple flowchart, we have the data and then we have the model, which doesn't follow explicit instructions. Remember, it tries to look at patterns in the data to make a prediction. Um, and broadly, all machine le learning boils down to these three things. OK, 
So that's the first part. That's the overview. Um, now I'll talk about different types. And this is where it becomes sort of buzzword city. So some of these, uh, some of the words here you may have seen already. So machine learning, deep learning comes out, unsupervised learning, big data, reinforcement learning, all these things. I'll try and talk about a couple now just to demystify it a bit. Um, but yes, it's it's quite overwhelming, even for people in the field. Um, so the two distinctions I want to draw is firstly between deep learning versus machine learning versus AI, because it all seems to be used interchangeably when there are in fact subtle differences. And then I'll talk about supervised versus unsupervised versus reinforcement learning. And they're all three different categories of machine learning. Okay, firstly, um, AI is the broadest term. AI is simply trying to use computer science to help machines solve problems. That kind of encapsulates everything. And then, do you remember from earlier, we had our definition of machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI where we're trying to help the computer solve problems without giving it explicit instructions. Um, so that's the key difference there between AI versus machine learning. And then if we zoom in even further with deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, which is where we're using these sophisticated architectures, which are modeled off the brain to try and make really, really powerful inferences and human performance, sometimes even superhuman performance. Um, so I'll give a quick example here. You may have heard neural networks or deep neural networks thrown around, and this is what sort of has powered the deep, deep learning revolution. Um, I won't talk through the technical details, but broadly it's modeled off the brain where you've got neurons which are interconnected and in theory by learning the weights between them and how these different connections, you can spot patterns and do really well in predictions. And these have been used for things like text classification, image classification, prediction of um, sort of traffic flow, wide variety of tasks, and they do really, really amazingly. Okay. Now I'll go supervised learning versus unsupervised learning versus reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is what everyone thinks of as machine learning because you have a set of data, so it's input output, um, and then you train a model. If you've done things like classification or regression, this is what supervised learning is. Um, to give an example here, you may want to diagnose diseases based on patient data. And this disease, these, um, this data could be medical scans, it could be medical records, it could be test results. But the key thing is here, you train the model on this data with the correct outcome. So I, in the example here, I may have given it uh, lots of, lots of, I think these are brain scans with lots of labels of different diseases or if it's got no disease. And then the model hopefully learns to spot the patterns, even though you haven't given it the patterns themselves. You've just said, this image has this disease, figure out why. Um, unsupervised learning is related to supervised learning, but it's used in the case when we don't have specific labels. So sometimes we have lots and lots of input data, so lots of images, lots of scans, but we don't have the labels, the correct value for each of them. And this is where unsupervised learning comes in. Um, this, this is encapsulates terminology such as clustering, when you're trying to um, put patients into different categories and dimensionality reduction, we are trying to make a very, very complex input, say an image into a simple simpler um, sets and so maybe just a few numbers. Um, the example here I've tried to predict is segmenting X-ray images. So sometimes when you're processing X-rays, apparently you may need to see the different parts of the chest. Um, and here a model has learned itself to try and spot the different sort of um, segments in the different categories of the chest. And to me, the untrained eye, it seems like it does pretty well, or at least it probably does better, better than I could do. Um, and to give maybe a more sort of a uh, day-to-day example, um, photo identification. So if you have Apple Photos or Google Photos, um, then it tries, you may notice that they'll sort of provide different people and they'll say, oh, these images have this person in. And that's really clever because you haven't actually told your phone um, which images have which person or even that these persons are separate people. It's gone away and learned in an unsupervised setting because remember, it doesn't have access to the labels that this person is Bob, this person is Michaela, this person is Sam, um, etc. Um, so that's really clever. So you've probably all encountered this already. Finally, I'll talk about reinforcement learning. And this on the one hand seems most complex, but on the other hand is the most intuitive. So this is where the model tries to make decisions to maximize the rewards. So crucially here, the model is operating in a live environment where any changes it will make will cause an update and trigger a change in the reward. 
So to give an example, which could be used in healthcare, um, is optimising patient scheduling. So say at the start of the week, we have our initial schedule of consultations, maybe scans, maybe operations. Clearly, some things may change over time. So patients may be admitted. Um, there may be emergency procedures which take precedence and the scheduling algorithm will need to adjust these um, in order to minimise the delays. And clearly, any adjustments it makes will have knock on effect on the schedule. So we will be able to see and predict the reward based on any changes it makes. Um, and if that didn't make sense, I've got an example which lots of you probably will be familiar with, which is the, uh, the probably the best reinforcement learning algorithm out there, which is the TikTok algorithm. And you'll notice that it's very clever because the TikTok algorithm is designed to maximise the amount of time you spend looking at your screen um, watching TikTok. So if you, for instance, start watching lots of cat videos, it will start showing you more and more cat videos because that causes you to watch more and more. But then it's not, it's a bit cleverer than that because then if you stop, necessarily liking cat videos so much and you shift the dog videos it might then show you lots of dog videos and so on um, and it's always trying to be one step ahead of you um, so these these are really clever algorithms um, and almost seems mystical but if you actually think through what it's doing um, it makes a lot of sense and previously i've talked um, about these sort of methods as if they were discrete methods and had to be used in isolation that's not quite true. You can have combinations. And in fact, the best state of the art systems do have combinations. So for instance, an image scan diagnosis probably has some unsupervised learning and some supervised learning. So if you're trying to analyze x-rays, you may have the image segmentation at the start um, to say, okay, these are the different parts of the chest that's learned unsupervised. And then you may have supervised model on top of that, which aims to predict based on these segments, the different categories of maybe high risk, low risk, or this disease or that disease. Um, and then incredibly sophisticated algorithms such as ChatGPT and social media often use all three. Um, and uh, ChatGPT is very relevant, so I'll talk through that quickly. Um, originally, it was trained on large parts of the internet using unsupervised learning, trying to sort of predict the words um, in the relevant places. And then it was fine tuned using a combination of supervised learning and reinforcement learning, where people were literally looking at the outputs and manually saying, oh, I prefer this, I don't, pref I don't like that. And you'll notice if you access the chat GPT interface that it will say, oh, do you prefer this prompt or that prompt? Because it's trying to be very cheeky and get extra um, supervision from users. And then social media algorithms, I'll talk through an example of the Netflix algorithm, which I realize may technically not be social media, um, but it's still along that lines. So um, for those of you who haven't gone through this procedure, when you sign up to Netflix, it will originally give you a list of movies and TV shows and you say, oh, I really like that one. I really like that one. I really like that one. Um, and then based on that, it will try and learn your preferences. So that's supervised learning. And then it will try and do unsupervised learning. So it will try and categorize you into different sets of users based on what your preferences are. So it will say, oh, Matthew really likes, say, Marvel movies. Let's put in with lots of other people who like Marvel movies. And that's unsupervised learning because we don't have people at Netflix going through labeling every single person because that's prohibitively um, expensive. And then finally, you've got reinforcement learning. Similar way to TikTok, you will have, oh, um, Matthew has suddenly started watching Sherlock. Clearly, he really likes detective movies. Let's show him much more of those. Um, and in this way, you have these combination producing a very sophisticated algorithm overall. OK, so that takes us past our second checkpoint. I'll just check to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, no, I don't think so. Q&A. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I think we're good. So hopefully you should now have awareness of sort of a broad overview of machine learning and the different types. Sorry if you've come across that before. Maybe it was a bit boring. Um, <laughs> Hopefully I'll engage you in this next section, which is how can you use it? And this is not necessarily so you as doctors could go over and start creating your own machine learning models, although that would be really cool if you did. It's mainly so that if you have some weird machine learning person and they present you this model, you kind of understand what's gone into it and why it produces the outputs the way it is. Um, right, uh, yes. So I've sort of broken it down into six main stages, um, data collection, data pre-processing, model selection, training, evaluation, and deployment. Um, and the two I want to focus on particularly are data collection and data pre-processing. 
because this this kind of myth in machine learning um, that all the magic happens in the in the model and you need the best model in the world an amazing model and really clever sort of black magic ways of training it um that's not quite true um the real fundamental bit which made machine learning possible is date data collection the huge huge amounts of data which are now being generated allow us to make these models um and likewise with all this data you need to process it so those two are really really important and that's why healthcare is so promising because now a body is larger than the NHS, it's collecting uh, huge, huge amounts of data, and really we can put that to use and do some amazing things. Okay, so data collection is fairly self explanatory. Um, you're trying to collect um, data on related to a specific problem. So, here again, I seem to really like chest x rays. Um, I think it's a chest x ray, and I think those are diseases. I'm not entirely sure, maybe they're features, they're little um, annotations. Um, so, clearly. Someone's gone through and picked out all these x-rays and said, oh, it's this, it's that. Um, and this is used for the supervised learning setting, remember, because we're giving it the labels. Um, there's a couple of couple of subtleties to data collection is it's not quite true that more data is better. You want good quality data as well, because sometimes you may collect data and you may label it incorrectly. And clearly the models are probably going to get quite confused if you do that. So you want to gather relevant data. And in healthcare, there's all sorts of things you could use. So you could access things like electronic health records, maybe medical imaging, wearable devices, um, which the team was talking about. So heart rate monitors, etc. Um, and if we, you can even amalgamate all these things together. So the latest models can use combinations of images and text and data from heart rates, um, which is very exciting. And then there's this data processing step and I remember before I had done research into machine learning, being very confused how you have an image and how does the model just like work its magic? Well, what we need to do first, we need to convert this image or this text or whatever it is into numbers. So for images, we tend to use pixel values. So we take the pixel values and we put it into numbers and then that can go into the model because the model can only deal with numbers. Um, so we can't just shove images in. We have to do some manipulation first and um, for um, text or words often you'll give each character or each sort of sequence of characters its own unique integer and then you can use that to feed into the model but crucially we have to convert our inputs into a set of numbers this data processing step also includes things like handling outliers so if you have really sort of um, inputs at the extreme end of the distribution you may not want to include them things like missing values um, if you have, um, say, tabular data and some columns are missing in some rows, what do you do with them? Do you fill them in? Do you predict them? Do you leave them out? Um, that's that's a bit of art and science. Um, and finally, normalization. So you want to make this um, as easy as possible for the model to train. Um, uh, I've just seen there's a question in the chat, um, which I will try. I'll come to at the end because um, I'll go through these six stages, but I haven't forgotten. OK, and then model selection. And this is I'd like to say it's a science, but really <laughs> it's kind of glorified trial and error. Mo this represents a very complex decision tree, which has been put out by one of the sort of leading machine learning software packages, um, which gives some um, rigor to it. But in reality, uh, most machine learning people will try models and whichever one's the best, they'll they'll use that based on some metric. So this makes it seem a lot more complicated than it is. But choosing the right model is crucial because different um, models work with different data. So there's no use using a text model if you've got image data, because um, that's clearly not gonna work. And also things like size and complexity. So if you've got a very simple problem that can be solved with a simple sort of line of best fits, then you should use that because that's gonna give the best results. There's no need to bring out the craziest model with billions and billions of parameters when just a couple will do. Um, so in general the rule here is simpler is better simple is mostly better um because as models become more complex you lead to all sorts of other problems which i think we'll probably talk about um in the workshop later today and now um so we've collected this data we've chosen which model we're going to use now we train it and i'll give the training loop in the supervised learning setting although similar sort of things are done in unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning so do you remember the three boxes we had before? We have our data, so we've collected it on the x-rays, we feed it into a model, and this model will now make a prediction. And the training part, 
says, OK, we have these predictions and some of them will be correct and some of them will be wrong. Based on these wrong values and these correct values, we can give it a score and then we can update the model to hopefully improve the score. So it may be accuracy and we may be trying to, OK, update the model so we get a better accuracy, so we get the more ones correct. Um, and that repeats and repeats and repeats until you, you're happy with the model or sometimes you can overtrain it where the model performance goes down and clearly you don't want to do that. So you want to train as much as possible. Probably also worth saying that. Um, oh, yes, um, I'll get I've just seen that question. I'll get to it. Um, it's probably worth saying that this training is the most expensive part. This is the part that people are spending lots of money on. Um, you may have seen in chat GPT. So the data collection and model training are too expensive. And yes, so I've just seen a question. Where does the model come from? OK, so I so the model is probably. So ideally, we've chosen the model in this model selection procedure in terms of where it comes from, and what it actually is. Often people, it would just be a set of, uh, a software package that people would import and it would be a couple of lines of code. There's been yeah, huge bodies of research in these specific um, models. Um, in general, though, they, they all sort of boil down to very simple operations of sort of adding, multiplying, dividing, etc. So it's rare that you'll create an entirely new model for your task. Normally, you'll just use a model that someone else has been uh, sort of the architecture that someone else has designed and then you'll adapt it for your own purposes. Um, and that's called fine tuning. So yes, that's a, that's a great question. Ah, I see. OK, why does overtraining model create inaccurate results? That's an excellent question. Um, and I guess the example is I can give a very, very simple, simple, trivial example is, for instance, if I have a small data set and, for instance, all I have split by people who are tall and people who are short, OK, and I'm trying to predict if people are going to say have a risk of fracture. Or, or have a fracture, I may say, OK, the, if for in, if by some chance everyone in the data set who's tall has a fracture, uh, the model may assume that everyone who's tall must automatically have a fracture because that's what it's seen. So if you train it and let it learn too much, it will fixate on these specific nuances of the data set. So clearly we don't want this in the case. So we don't want it to make these over assumptions, these incorrect assumptions. Um, in reality, it might be much better to stop it training earlier. So it says, OK, if I'm tall, I could have a fracture, but it's not necessarily um, the case. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Um, yes, that was a simple example, but it does occur with more complex models as well. Finally, um, model evaluation. So this is you can use. Oh, OK. OK, great. Thank you, Stacey. How are unsupervised models trained? Uh, we've got a bit of time, so I'll talk into that. OK, so normally um, unsupervised models are training, so you don't have access to the labels. So what you do, the idea is you still make a prediction, but instead of giving something like accuracy, which you don't necessarily know, you will use some other proxy metric to try and um, try and guess how good it is. So let, let's see if I can give a simple example. Um, you may okay, you may go um, something used common in um, image uh, is sorry in word um, prediction is uh, uncertainty. So you may go okay. Often when these models make predictions, i.e. predictions of the next word in sequence, it may be uncertain. So it may go oh, it may be this word or maybe that word, and this uncertainty is inherent to the model. And you may in the unsupervised learning try to train it by minimizing this uncertainty. And notice this uncertainty isn't something provided by the machine learning person or the data. This is something provided by the model itself. So the model is making an assessment based on its own predictions and which will go to update its own uh, parameters, which will then in turn update the um, predictions. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, that was one specific example um, and there's lots more ways, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of actually you can still get something to optimize for, even if you don't have the true values. Um, great questions. Um, yes, OK, thank you. Um, model evaluation. Um, I think medical students, at least the ones I know, do lots of things about precision and recall for like drugs and for treatments. It was a big thing around sort of the COVID test discoveries. And these are some metrics we may want to optimize for for our model. So this is, again, in the supervised learning setting, assuming we have access to 
things which are actually relevant so we know which elements are relevant and which elements aren't we can calculate precision and recall and say okay we want to increase these as much as possible um, and that's great there's also things like you have people drawing curves you may have heard of precision recall curves um, all sorts of metrics here but the key thing is you need to pick some metric which you can calculate which will give you a number which you can then optimize for to say this model is better than that model and these metrics um, is again how you detect that sort of um, overfitting i said overtraining can be bad well this is how you check you have um, these metrics and if they start decreasing you go well i've clearly done something wrong i've overtrained the model and let's stop here because this is the best one we're going to get finally i'll talk about model deployment um, and this is something which isn't often considered, but is absolutely crucial. So at this stage, we've collected all our data, we selected our model, we've trained it to the best we can. We said, OK, it's got this performance, it's got this precision. Um, how, how do we then actually like, get this? How do we use it? Well, often you then need to put it on some service somewhere and it's probably going to be a, it's probably going to be a cloud service and this throws up all sorts of issues because then people say, oh, well, I don't want the model making predictions on the cloud. Um, I don't want my data going up there um, or different um, different people, different practices may have access to different data and maybe you can't share them, your data privacy. So if my data and these are all sort of very complex questions. But one thing I will say is lots of the medical services are already on the cloud. They're already run by sort of Amazon, Microsoft, Google and this data has to be stored somewhere. So in a sense, it's kind of unavoidable that we have to put this on the cloud um, because the NHS isn't going to run, well, as far as I'm aware, it's not going to run its own sort of computing cloud facility. That's just way beyond scope. So this still has to happen. Um, and yes, um, so we have our complete workflow. And I've seen another question. Can you untrain a model? Um, so you, you can. Um, I guess you could if you want to, but in reality, what people tend to do is checkpoints. So remember I said we go around this loop, this training loop where we make predictions, we update parameters. Normally we'll take checkpoints. So say every 10 loops, we checkpoint and we save the model we've got to that version. And then as soon as we notice the performance starts to decrease, we just roll back and take the best model that we had already. So you could untrain it. Um, and actually I know people who do very clever things with untraining, but the simplest approach is just to take take a checkpoint and take the best model you've got already. Um, yes, great question. So we've got the yeah, we've got the workflow where we go data collection, selection, training, evaluation and deployment. Um, hopefully that makes sense. You, as clinicians, you'll probably only see the deployment stage, so the predictions, but it's worth being aware if some machine learning person comes to you and tries says, oh, I've got this great model. It's worth thinking, OK, what type of model is it? Is it, is it appropriate? Where's this data coming from? And talking about where's data coming from, data privacy. I briefly mentioned this earlier and Hatim talked about it, um, but it's a huge, huge issue about because we need model. We need data to train these models. But does that mean whoever has access to the model can then go and see this data? Um, that's that's unknown um, and also related to this is bias because these date these models again i going back to the example of sort of tall people who have fractures if your data set prehistorically all tall people have fractures then in the future it will predict if it's a tall person it's going to have a fracture regardless of um, any other characteristics so this may be a correct pattern it may be an incorrect pattern um but it's a huge issue if we get bias data in then we're going to get bias predictions out um what do we do? There's, there are technical approaches trying to minimize this, um, but it's worth considering and thinking, OK, well, if I were to change some protect, protected characteristics of this person, does that affect the model prediction? And should it affect the model prediction? OK, and then explainability. So if you picture yourself as a, as a clinician, you've got a patient in, you've put all the data in this model, it's made a prediction and it's gone, OK, this person has this specific disease. Um, that's kind of useless to you unless um, you can sort of see where the model's coming from. And that's really hard because these models are very complex. Um, and I assume doctors are not going to be machine learning experts because that's just too, too much. Um, so on the graph here on the right, you can see this is trying to explain. It's trying to explain the important features. So, so why the model thinks 
uh, given prediction is the case. Although this is, I would argue, this is even re this is really hard to understand. And even these graphs don't help much. So it's still a very, very active area of research to explain exactly why a model makes a prediction the way it does. Because until we can explain it, we probably can't use it. Um, or it's not as useful as it could be. OK, um, thank you. Uh, the last thing I will say is that if you want to sign up, we do research in the group. Um, if you want to hear about some of our research, and potentially we run user studies, um, you can sign up there. Um, there's a Google form and you can fill out your email. OK, and before I forget, there's one question which I didn't answer earlier, um, which was, OK, can machine learning models encounter challenges when dealing with specialised cases that require human experts to rely Hmm. OK, so that's a really good question. So I think that's saying is if we have really, really rare, rare diseases, so maybe there's only 50 or 100 people in the world who've got them and we don't necessarily have data, can the model make a prediction which a human expert could? Um, currently, there are approaches, but it's probably not going to be as good as a human expert because those predictions on very, very rare diseases requires extrapolation um, based on what you know already. and models aren't that great about about that at least not as good as humans um so yes that is that is something to consider so if we start rolling out all these models they'll they're most likely to predict very common diseases but really rare diseases which doctors and experts may be aware of may just be swept under the rug so yeah great great question um okay i think that was that was all the questions um uh, yes, are there any more in the chat or anyone else want to say anything? I don't know how much time time we've got. Um, I was just going to say thank you, Matthew. It's um, been really insightful again. Um, and I think you've managed to make a really complex topic very much easier to di digest. It's always difficult when there's all these different aspects to it and a lot of clinicians or healthcare professionals and students aren't going to have that that knowledge at this, at this stage. And so I think you've made it really easy for them to to now use it as a foundation, so thank you. Um, I think Hatton's putting up some resources in the chat as well, which is really helpful. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. You've you've answered all of the ones that have come through. So I think, um, I think unless Hatton's got anything to say, I think we can end, but. I was yeah. going to do a quick, um, so I was going to do a quick overview of kind of where we are with AI on the NHS. Okay. Um, but I won't keep people too long. But I just want to give people an overview of kind of what's happening so far. Um, and I'm going to put, um, I'm, I, I can see Helen Stokes Lampard is on the call. I don't want to put you on the spot, Helen, but if you are able to to just briefly say hello. So Helen is a GP, um, and uh, well, Helen, you can introduce yourself and and tell a little, tell us a little bit about your interest in this space. Hi, thank you, Hassim. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm Helen Stokes Lampard. So I'm a frontline GP in Litchfield in Staffordshire. That's the easy bit. Um, I used to be chair of the Royal College of GPs and I have been chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges most recently. And I, I always joke that the Medical Royal Colleges Academy is probably the most important medical body that most doctors and healthcare professionals have never heard of because we're the umbrella for all the colleges and all the various disciplines. And we help set the standards for all medical education, how you diagnose death, so those big meaty issues that affect all of us in our daily lives. But we we are not a membership body for individual doctors. Right. So I've recently finished from doing that. And um, most recently, I have been asked to be on the expert panel for the uh, Frontier AI Task Force. I'm sure if you're on this call, you'll be aware of the massive interest that's going on uh, nationally in the UK. Westminster government is is very concerned and excited by the prospect of AI on our daily lives. And the recognition that while all these amazing, brilliant technical people are being employed to work hard uh, and do great stuff, um, there's also something about oversight governance and asking the daft questions. So they've pulled together a, a very small expert panel and the other there are seven of us on it. Uh, the other six of them are all either IT, tech, national security um, or uh, security and defence, na national defence uh, and me. So I'm there as kind of 
everything else. So I'm there to provide what I call basically the voice of common sense, the pragmatism as a frontline clinician of what it's going to feel like, what it's going to be like, the ethical challenges, the practical applications, the ways in which it will be used by the public, the, the well-intentioned public and the mal-intentioned public. And obviously in time there'll be ethicists and, and, and deep thinkers brought in from a whole range of issues. But it's thrust me into an interesting spotlight uh, because my knowledge of AI is I suspect comparable or even lower than yours. Uh, I'm no super expert in this space, um, although I've been doing some a lot of reading recently. And if you are genuinely interested, then I can recommend a book that I've my, my just finished reading, which is fantastic, uh, The AI Revolution in uh, Medicine, uh, which really focuses on GPT-4, but clearly there's plenty of others we need to be looking at. So I'll pause there. I think, Hattin, was that what you wanted? I just, this Perfect. is the future. We yeah. absolutely all need to be on this. And so I'm delighted that so many people are taking the time to attend a course like this. And and thank you, by the way, Matthew, that was great. I learned a lot. Much appreciated. Thank you, Helen. And, and yeah, that book is a, is, a, is a tremendous read. Definitely recommend it. And um, and and Matthew, yeah, your talk has been really helpful even for me just to kind of refresh on my learning and I'm trying to pick up some of those skills because it is a growing field. And look, my, my as healthcare professionals, I don't think we need to be experts in this space. Um, there are experts like Matthew out there in this area, but what we do need to do is try and understand some of the complexities around it and some of the how it might impact the people that we serve and look after, um, and, and and therefore be able to and also be able to work with people like Matthew to to be able to overcome some of those challenges. And so what I want to do is very briefly over the last.